So let's continue with talking about uh, genome size and organization, how these things are linked. There's a whole range of sizes of genomes from very, very small to very large. Uh, in general, prokaryotes generally have much smaller genomes than eukaryotes. Uh, but then within eukaryotes, once you get into multicellular organisms, your link between genome complexity and uh, biological complexity tends to get a little muddled, especially in the case of plants, which can have really elevated ploidy levels and therefore have much bigger genomes, uh, mainly due to giant uh, genome duplications or chromosomal duplications over evolutionary time. So that's one of the fun things we can track to sort of see how um, different organisms are related and how they've changed over time. So there are a few mechanisms that increase the amount of DNA in a genome. Okay, three main ones are polyploidization, horizontal gene transfer, and then DNA duplication. Okay, so genome size tends to increase much more than it decreases um, because it's a lot handier to have what you need sort of packed in the closet and you can't really just build something from scratch very easily. So the uh, sweaters in the closet analogy uh, I'll go over briefly. Polyploidization to start with, um, everybody remembers haploid is when you have one copy of each chromosome. Uh, and then most animals are diploid where we have two copies of each chromosome. I use a capital X sometimes shorthand for chromosome. That's our 2N, okay? And then when you have more than two copies, that's generally what we refer to as a polyploid. Um, so triploid and tetraploid both fall under this categorization. And this is when you have those huge size increases in genomes, it's generally due to this like massive uh, polyploidization event where you just, instead of uh, two of each chromosome, now you have four, that might get doubled again to get uh, eight and so on and so forth. So there are two ways you can sort of completely duplicate a genome. It can be the same genome that got copied and then maybe there was an um, instance during meiosis or something, a non-disjunction event, and so you have uh, two copies of the same genome. Alternatively, the other way this can happen is uh, allopolyploidy, where you have a different species that is uh, combined and donated that extra set of genomes through like a hybridization event where you have two um, sets of chromosomes from different species uh, coming together in one organism. And so this idea that this has happened throughout evolution is called paleo, paleo polyploidy, and that's the uh, 2N, sorry, 2R hypothesis. And so check out the duplication of genomes video that I've linked for more information on that. So in contrast to um, polyploidization, which happens uh, via meiosis and um, non-disjunction events, horizontal gene transfer occurs between organisms uh, not within the reproductive cycle, so genes moving laterally between organisms. So a example of this is like when a virus inserts DNA into a cell, uh, the viral infection may go away, <clears throat> but that inserted DNA actually remains. Uh, bacteria do this all the time by swapping plasmids, um, and they found a lot of uh, dicot um, plants actually have a lot of bacteria DNA from agrobacterium just through uh, gene insertion and um, transformation events that have happened naturally in the soil. So it happens a lot more frequently than people think. Sort of in the smallest changes category, we have DNA duplications. Basically either a whole chromosome or a part of a chromosome is duplicated and then reintegrated back into the genome. And there's different versions here where the DNA has been flipped or swapped but all of these lead to more DNA present in the um, genome and more copies of genes that are available to mutate or change or be worked upon. So here's the sweater analogy that they're talking about in the book is that um, if it's very advantageous for you to already have something that you need in that if it gets, suddenly gets cold and you could just pop into your closet and pull out a sweater for that occasion, great. And so you have an adaptation readily available to you that, that can get expressed easily. Um, so in general, it's more advantageous to hold on to a whole bunch of things that you don't need at the moment, just in case down the line you're gonna need them. If you go full minimalist and get rid of absolutely everything that you don't need at a particular time, you are going to have an issue of say there's a giant environmental change 
Like, it gets really, really cold. You don't have a jacket, and even going to the store and buying something means you're going to freeze to death. That's a problem. Uh, on the other hand, if you get too cluttered and there's just too much stuff in your genome, that can also be a problem uh, because there is a metabolic cost for copying over your DNA every time you want to, you know, multiply up your cells there. So, but in general, this is more advantageous than not having what you need. So genomes tend to really in err on the side of uh, just keeping everything and increasing in size up to a point. So genomes can lose functions over time. And if you go long enough with there never ever being a cold snap, you might start to lose those, say, sweater genes, and it wouldn't be disadvantageous. So um, if, if genetic material is not being actively selected for or against, it can just get lost, and there's not a pressure for um, having to get rid of anything that's lost those genes. So uh, this can also result, though, that your organism is going to get confined to a specific habitat or way of life or something like a blind cave fish that no longer have eyes, only going to do so hot when they're in caves. Okay. So a lot of times you also see this in endosymbionts and parasites where they lose the ability to function on their own outside of their host. So. Genome organization. So generally this is where we're talking about how DNA is grouped within a genome. Uh, in a bacteria, this is just a one singular circular closed chromosome, and then there's a lot of extra chromosomal DNA uh, called plasmids, little circular loops. Okay, And so this can vary by bacteria, but in general there's just the one chromosome and then a whole bunch of little plasmids that are more easily swapped around than the genes on the main chromosome. Eukaryotic cr genomes are uh, organized by chromosomes. So each chromosome is one super long DNA strand, and so these are packaged up via the cell in the nucleus uh, into chromosomes by um, folding around these proteins, which is my little, I don't have my little thing, uh, called histone proteins, okay? And they wrap around them and form what's known as a nucleosome, so like a little ball, and then those tucks, those balls get all tucked together into what's called a chromatin fiber, and then those get looped around even more into the full chromosome, okay? And the other main parts of the chromosome, we have the telomere at the end. The telomere is the um, end of the chromosome. We have the centromere, where the two copies of the chromosome sort of meet when, when they're condensed during metaphase. And then we have the arms. The P arm is the short arm and the Q arm is the long arm. A karyotype is when you have a complete set of chromosomes. In this case, this is a human karyotype. So somebody has gone in to a human cell and uh, sorted out all this DNA and very nicely color coded it. And we can see that we have all 22 chromosome pairs plus our sex chromosome pair. In this case, uh, if we have two large X chromosomes, this person is a female. We can tell that from, well, okay, we're going to back up because two X chromosomes does not necessarily, uh, boy. So there's another stain called gasma that binds to DNA and makes a visible uh, banding pattern on chromosomes because there are some areas of the chromosomes that are wound tighter than others and so the stain will bind more to those regions and that'll give us this reproducible almost zebra stripe pattern in the chromosomes. So where the stain is really dark, that's where the chromatin is really densely packed. We call that the heterochromatin. It's not as available for transcription. And then the other side is where there's a light stain band. That's where the chromatin is less dense. We call that the euchromatin, U standing for true. And that's uh, easier for transcription and stuff to occur in those areas. So that'll be something we'll talk about when we get to the gene regulation and how the chromatin um, binding really affects whether or not DNA is expressed. But, so we have heterochromatin and euchromatin, whether or not the chromatin is very densely packed or open and more available for transcription. So DNA is very rarely just like a free-floating thread in the cell. It's usually wrapped up around and stored around proteins. Uh, and so in this case, we have what are called histone proteins that pack together and form a what's called a nucleosome. And then the DNA will wrap around that twice. So 146 base pairs wrap around each little nucleosome. 
And then another histone, histone 1, helps stack those histones together in a more tightly packed fiber. Okay, so this is the sort of the difference between euchromatin uh, over here that's open and available for transcription. And then over here we have our densely packed heterochromatin where all the histones are tightening uh, the DNA up and packing it all tight. So when you get that thick fiber, that 30 nanometer fiber of chromatin, it then gets looped uh, into kind of an even tighter package. And that's what we're going to see during um, cell division uh, when the chromosomes condense. Uh, so one human cell contains about two meters of DNA that's folded down to fit inside the nucleus of the cell. So it gets really, really tightly packed. So the um, question there, is there a lot of gene transcription going on during cell division? And the answer would be no, the DNA is not available for transcription. It's all packed up tight. So DNA is not only found in the nucleus, it's also found out in the other organelles, specifically in plant cells, the chloroplast, and in both plant and animal and fungal cells, you have the mitochondria. Uh, but they don't contain all of the DNA that they need. There are also um, genes in the nuclear chromosomes that are needed for mitochondrial function. So the idea of the symbiogenesis hypothesis, the where a bacteria sort of gets absorbed into a eukaryotic cell precursor and then stays and is kind of captured in order to uh, produce energy for the cell. Um, that hypothesis has gotten more and more evidence that it's uh, pretty much almost a theory at this point that mitochondria and chloroplasts were engulfed bacteria that have um, lost function over time but have remained in the cells about a billion years ago. So back in the nucleus, uh, the chromosome number, the number of chromosomes that a uh, particular organism has, it varies by species, anywhere from just two to hundreds. Okay, so one chromosome is one double-stranded DNA molecule, and then each chromosome is different depending on its DNA sequence. It can be long, short, tiny, uh, massive, and then uh, in a diploid organism like humans, we have one pair of chromosomes in each of our cells, one that was inherited from your maternal parent, one that was inherited from your paternal parent. And so those have kind of mostly matching uh, uh, DNA sequences, like the same gene will be in the same place on both chromosomes, but there might be a different allele of each gene uh, on one chromosome compared to the other. So again, ploidy is the number of sets of chromosomes you have. If you're diploid, you have two sets. Like we do. If you're haploid, you have one set. Ooh, I have my laser pointer on. Uh, humans are diploid, so we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So our diploid number is 46, and our haploid number is 23. And here's sort of a single chromosome at metaphase. Now this is actually two separate strands of DNA joined at the centromere. Okay, but uh, just sort of terminology of chromosomes here we have the centromere is this middle part where they are touching. Okay. The telomeres are the ends of the chromosome. Okay. And then we have our P arm, which is the short arm, and the Q arm, which is the long arm. Uh, sometimes they're roughly the same size. That's just sort of an um, old terminology that's stuck around for a while. When we're at metaphase, we have our sister chromatids that have been duplicated. Okay, and so this is sometimes called a, um, okay, so our freshly uh, divided cell would just have this one chromosome here. It got pulled apart from the sister chromatid, and cell cycles are going to begin, and as we get into uh, the cell cycle phases, we're going to be replicating that DNA sequence to make the sister chromatids over here. And then if we were undergoing regular mitosis, this would line up uh, via metaphase and get pulled apart to the next division. If we're going into meiosis, what now matters is that we have this homologous pair. We have the, uh, say if this is chromosome one, this one came from your mom and this one came from your dad, and they are going to get pulled apart during the first phase of meio meiosis. So sister chromatid is the replicated DNA. The homologous chromosome is when you've got both chromosomes, uh, one from mom and one from dad, paired up next to each other. This is also sometimes called a tetrad. Uh, 